Um, check with Don. I'm not sure.
see ya.
hear you all the way up here, so I'm gonna I'm gonna need some uh, in, in uh, increased engagement. We'll call it that. So I, I don't know if you uh, realize it, but this is my favorite part of being a pastor. It's not putting on waiters. That's not my favorite. Not standing in this warm bathtub water with waiters on. That's not my favorite either. But what this represents is new families and new people following Christ. And I'm excited that we've got a baptism this morning. And uh, I, I just could not be more pleased that we have the opportunity to celebrate with somebody that they have chosen to follow Christ and that they've chosen to do it with our church family. And so before we even get started this morning, I hope that you realize and remember that every person that's sitting next to you is not just um, not just an acquaintance and not just a friend. It's not just somebody that you happen to know because you go to the same place on Sunday. We're called as believers to be brothers and sisters in Christ, that we've been saved by the, the blood of Jesus Christ, and we have more in common than anybody else in the world because of our Savior. And I hope that you... Uh, cherish our family the way that I do. I'll tell you, I've been away for a week, and just being away for one Sunday is enough. It's too much, to be honest with you. I miss our family. I miss our church. I miss the love and the appreciation and the family and the camaraderie that we have as a body of believers, and so I just get excited when God brings more people to that family, and I hope that you do too. I do want to make mention of just a couple things. First things first, if you are a first-time guest, we are so glad to have you with us this morning. We really do see each other as brothers and sisters in Christ at our church, and we want the opportunity to reach out to you and to be a minister and a help to you in your everyday life. And because of that, we have a flap on the side of our bulletin. I hope that you got a bulletin on the way in. If not, you can feel free to wave, and, and one of these uh, beautiful teenage boys in the back will run and grab one for you. He's waving. He's ready. He's on it, let me tell you. If you didn't get a bulletin, they'll grab one for you, but the, the big purpose of that connection card that I'm talking about is it gives us the opportunity to pray for you, reach out to you, and to get involved with you in your life. We're not going to spam you. Uh, maybe one email a week tops, and you can, you can set it to go to the trash folder if you want to. It just gives us the opportunity to reach out to you and really connect with you. So we hope that you'll take advantage of that connection card. It also gives you a place to, to put any prayer requests, or maybe you'd like to get involved in ministry and you haven't been able to to this point, or maybe you just have a question you'd like to ask about scripture or you'd like to ask about our church. All of those come directly to me, and I'd love to reach out to you and answer any questions you may have through that. Next thing I want to mention is that we are having our regular weekly services this week. So this Wednesday, there will be Bible study. There will be children's, uh, uh, what do we call that, um, Bible Explorers Club. And there will be teen service tonight at 3 o'clock at the YMCA. I know I don't mention that very often, but I hope that you have uh, been praying for our teenagers this week and the next week to follow. We are talking to our teens about coming to Bible camp, coming to youth camp this summer. Um, and if you didn't know, last summer when we took kids to camp, two kids got saved. This past fall when we took kids to uh, Reverb, which is kind of a mini camp, four kids got saved. And so we're really praying that God will give us six kids or more to get saved this summer camp. We've been having about 15 to 20 teenagers show up and, and have youth group with us at the YMCA. So I hope that you will pray for our teenagers and that they'll come to know Jesus Christ through the YMCA youth group. Well, I know Thomas is getting antsy over here. Thomas has been coming. Thomas and Kayleen are engaged to be married in just a couple months, and they started visiting our church right before Christmas of this past year. Now, I, want, I say that because I want to share with you what connected Thomas and Kayleen to First Baptist Church. You may have seen a sign outside of our church at the corner here of, uh, I think this is Oak Street, and 41 that says men's prayer line and then it has a number down there. What you may not have known is one of the men in our church, Derek Chipman, is the person who put that sign up there. And so what happened was Thomas called the prayer line. Now Thomas told me afterwards he was really trying to be a little bit of an instigator. He was going to call and see if this guy knew what he was talking about and try to test him theologically and, and see what was going on with this prayer line guy. But in the process of talking to Derek and having conversation and Derek praying for Thomas, Thomas and Kayleen chose to visit our church. You say, well, why are you sharing that? 
Because Derek took an opportunity to use the influence that God had given him to reach people for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not sharing that just to brag on Derek, although I am proud of Derek and appreciate that he does that. I'm sharing that to tell you, you have a circle <coughs> of influence and you've been called to use it. You have gifts and abilities and you've been called to use them. God desires to use what he's given you to reach those in our community with his love. And so I want to encourage you. Maybe that doesn't mean you're going to go and put signs out. I'm not telling you you have to. Uh, in fact, one men's prayer line probably enough. But there's something that God has given you that he intends for you to share with those around us and bring them to Jesus Christ. So without any further ado, I'm going to ask, uh, not Derek, Derek, you're not joining me in here. <laughs> we'll get too crowded in here pretty quick. I'm going to ask Thomas to join me in here in the baptistry. Now, I told him, when it's kids, I leave it cold, because then I don't get hot. But since he's an adult, I didn't leave it cold. Uh, if you don't know Thomas, this is Thomas. And, and last name Tyler, right? Uh, he's got Thomas Tyler. And so Thomas... Like I said, has been coming for a few months. Uh, we had a long discussion over Indian food in Venice. Uh, I think the Indian restaurant, the next time I show up, is probably going to require a down payment at the door, uh, just because how long we kept the table. Uh, but we had a great conversation about God and about Jesus Christ and about how Jesus has changed Thomas's life. And so through that conversation, I came to know that Kaylee and Thomas were dedicated followers of Jesus Christ. And also through that conversation, I found out that Thomas, though he'd been baptized as a young person, came to know Christ later in life. And I told Thomas that that's a little bit of getting the cart before the horse, and he agreed. And so when he called and wanted to join the church, we decided and discussed that he would be baptized again. And, and, and as he's baptized this morning, I want to remind you, the purpose of baptism, he's not having any sins washed away this morning. There's no more sins on him. They've been washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. But what we're doing is an outward symbol of what inwardly happened in Thomas's life. And by the baptism, you'll see that I, when I take Thomas under the water, that's a picture of the death and burial of Jesus Christ. And when we raise Thomas back out of the water, it'll be a picture of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And along with that, the new life that Thomas has chosen to begun as a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ. So I'm just going to ask Thomas a few questions, and then we'll get him wet. That's the plan. All right, so... Thomas, are you a sinner? Yes. You are. We all are. Anybody else? Let's, by a show of hands, are we sinners? Yes. Ain't that the truth? <clears throat> Thomas, what has saved you from your sin? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. And what did he do? He died. He died again on the third day, uh, filling the scriptures. Amen. And because of that, Thomas, if you were to die today, where would you go? Heaven. You go to heaven. Now, Thomas, I, I want to give you the opportunity to share a little bit of your testimony uh, just right now. Yeah, so... Um, it was basically, I was telling John before, it was basically an atheist that got me uh, thinking and questioning my faith. Uh, we worked together, and, um, you know, he would just challenge me. He would, he would challenge me on the Bible and whether it's really the written word of God. And uh, I was raised in a Christian home, so I had a lot of traditions that were really strong, but I didn't really have a uh, defense for it. So it caused me to dive into the Bible, look into apologetics, history. Um, uh, textual criticism, a bunch of stuff like that. And uh, when I started actually reading my Bible, instead of saying that I read it, um, I would see things like, uh, if we say we're in the light, yet we walk in darkness, um, we lie and the truth is not in us. And uh, I was walking in darkness every day, and I was calling myself a Christian, and I was living an immoral life. And uh, so I just kept reading, and I, I discovered... Uh, word repentance, and uh, I didn't really understand what that meant, and um, started really listening to a lot of uh, leaders in, in, uh, in the Christian faith, and uh, really challenged myself to um, actually be what I said I was being, and I was a slave of sin, and I saw that we're called to be slaves of righteousness, and I wasn't a slave of righteousness, so um, that's basically what I had. So I want to point out, I just want to draw out this truth from what Thomas just said. When he went to Scripture, it revealed in him his inability to be what he was called to be. It revealed in him that he was not what he should be, that he was falling short of the glory of God. 
but by the blood of Jesus Christ, he was made new. And so today, because of Thomas's decision to follow Jesus Christ, because of his faith in Jesus Christ alone to save him from his sin, we know that Thomas has chosen eternal life. He's chosen life abundant, and because of that, we're going to baptize Thomas here today. And so, Thomas, I, I, I love you and I appreciate you. I've only known you a short time, but your love for the Lord and your excitement about serving him um, breathe new life in this old body. I'll put it that way. So I'm excited about having you as a part of our church family. So my brother Thomas, by your profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Raise the Lord. right now. Don't get your hopes up. I didn't get to this last week, so, but we're not going to. But that was the highlight of the service. You've already seen it. We are so excited, so I hope that you will take the opportunity today. Kayleen is also joining our church this morning. She has been baptized, and she is coming by a statement of faith, and we'll present them at the end of the service. But I hope that you'll take an opportunity and welcome them to our church family <laughs> I don't know if you noticed, Thomas is taller than I'm used to baptizing, so that was, that was a chore, so my hard work is over today, and uh, now comes the easy part, but let's stand together as we worship and sing. I got worried, Thomas was under a really long time, looking for his head to come up.
there was a picture of his pickup truck turning right on a red light where it was not legal. And so in the letter was a ticket for $140. Apparently, when he had gone into town in the Gulf of Springs, he had made this turn and he didn't realize it. So he was really angry about this, so he decided to be sarcastic. So he wrote a check for $140, and he took a picture of it, and then he mailed that back to <laughs> So my friend said, well, what did they do then? He said, well, I got another letter back from the church department yesterday. And my friend said, well, what was in the letter? He said, well, I opened it up, and it was just a picture. It was a picture of handcuffs. <laughs> <laughs> I guess he's going to pay that too. <laughs> I got a note here from... Um, Sergio and Susan LaRosa, who are missionaries that we've been following for years, they're in Peru, Truillo, Peru, near Lima. And so I wanted to share this note I just got from them. It says, it's been a long time since we, our last newsletter. It was last August. So sorry for the long silence on our part. Time flies when you're having fun. This month marks the 10th anniversary of the John Boyce Memorial Library, and on March 21st, 2009, we opened the library with a service in the third floor auditorium. Much teaching, reading, learning, counseling, prayer, and laughter has taken place in this building since then. We are grateful to our loving and faithful God and to many fellow missionaries, pastors, and teachers, both Latino and American, who have made this fruitful ministry possible. There is now a new generation of Christian leaders and still much to do. Thank you for your vital part in this ministry through your faithful prayers and financial support. The other activities that Sergio has been involved in is a conference on the biblical canon, which he was invited to be one of three speakers. Then he spoke at the National Baptist Youth Conference in Chileo, Peru, in October. And then a local church invited him to help them begin a monthly study and fellowship group for men and he has preached at several different local churches on Sunday mornings for various special events. The classes for the Certificate of Christian Ministry program, they teach at a seminary there in Lima. It says this program will begin again this month on Monday nights after the three-month summer break. Yes, it's summer in Peru. The next class is a focused study on Abraham. Many of the students are young people. Truillo is a home to five major universities. Quite a few of our students are also university students who are studying the Bible and theology in order to be better prepared to defend their faith and respond intelligently to arguments and questions they encounter in their university classrooms and with their peers. They are, in, they are an enthusiastic group and it's refreshing to interact with them as they learn and grow. The mix of pastors and young people makes for some good discussions too. Thank you once again for your interest and partnership with us in leadership training and development. Your prayers and financial support make it possible for us to live and serve here. God bless and keep each and every one of you. Grace and peace, Sergio and Susan LaRose. So that's an update. That's the first time we've heard from them since August. They are keeping on. As I like to say, keep calm and Jesus on. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for blessing us this morning. We thank you, Lord, that we are a witness to another person to be baptized and, and remain in, in your kingdom and in your army. We thank you, Lord, for people that will stand up for Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for, for the Larosas and the work that they do there in Peru. We thank you that they are preaching and teaching the gospel to all that will listen. They teach in a university, Lord, which in this day and time needs so much to be Christian teachers. We ask, Lord, that you would help them continue the work that they do, that you would protect them, give them the wisdom, the strength, the knowledge, all they need to continue to do the work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, let's stand and sing more than comfort. <laughs>
for a long time, but um, I bet I bet you'll remember it. But man, when I look at the lyrics of this song, this is like everything that God, you know, God's everything that we need. Like every, like it doesn't matter what you need. If you're lonely, if you are dirty, if you're sad, like God is everything. Um, so sing with us.
We've got some missionaries who have stopped in to say hello. I know we have some new members. I know we have some that have not been in a while. So you got a lot of work to do this morning. So I hope that you'll get around and let everybody you can know that you love them this morning. <laughs> Hey, I read your email. I I like I, I kind of got all the way through the personality guidelines, but the inside looks great. So okay, take something off of this play too. <laughs>
I hope that you are as happy to see me as I am to see you. I'll just leave it at that. I won't, I won't ask. The only, the only bad part is I, I missed Art last week. I love hearing Art preach and sing, and I know he does a great job. So we'll have to have him come back sometime when I'm actually here, too. That'll, that'll help me out. But um, anyhow, I am so glad to be back. I am also so excited to continue the sermon series. Now, I, I just have to warn you. Usually, so, so my regular practice is I, about three months out, write the outlines of sermons and the, the text of sermons, and then the week of, I'll build some kind of meat onto the bones of the sermon, and then I'll spend Thursday, Friday, Saturday. It's usually the only three days I have to really mull over the sermon and add um, the jewelry and the uh, accessories on the, you know, on the sermon. Now, here's the problem. I wrote this sermon and put the meat on the bones over two weeks ago. So that means I've had like 17 days to really think about stories and applications and things that go on. And so I, I, I'm going to do my best to limit myself, but I am excited about this passage and about what God has for us this morning. So to refresh your memory, we have been talking out of 2 Peter chapter 1 about stepping up in your faith. Now, we've been using that as the jump off, kind of the launching point, because in that passage, we're given a list of things that as believers, if we will do those, the Bible says that if you, are, uh, if you grow in these, if they abound in you, they'll make you so that you never fall, right? So, so the goal as a believer is to be more and more Christ-like, right? That, that should be our strive, that should be our desire, that should be our heart. And through this passage, it shows us, well, here are some things that should be added to your faith that will make you more and more like Christ. And so here's what we're talking about this morning. I, I want to remind you, it said, add to your faith virtue. So I'll read 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. It says, now for this very reason also, find all diligence, working hard at it, in your faith, supply moral excellence. Remember, we talked about virtue. Doing what's right and not doing what's wrong. Pretty tall order for the first thing on the list. Then he says, and in your moral excellence, knowledge. Remember, we talked about how that was not just a book knowledge. It wasn't just memorizing enough verses and then you'll be okay. It was a true personal knowledge of Jesus Christ. The same way that you know your wife, you know your husband, you know your best friend, you know your mom, you know your dad, you know them personally, you walk through life together, and because of that walking through life together, there's a knowledge that's deeper than just they have blue eyes and they like chocolate. It goes further, it goes deeper. He says, add to your knowledge, uh, and in your knowledge, self-control. Remember last week, well, two weeks ago, we talked about temperance. We talked about how self-control is a myth. You can't control yourself. If you could control yourself, Jesus died in vain. We can't control ourselves. It has to be the Spirit controlling us, and that has to be a choice that we make. And so today, we go from self-control or, or temperance to perseverance. Or another way we could say this is endurance. Step up in endurance. Step up in perseverance. And so I think that it's really neat... <laughs> This line of thinking, if you, if you follow it, even just logically, we start with the idea of faith. Faith is the foundation of everything that we are. Because I know who God is, because I know that Jesus has done everything to save me from my sin, because I know that Jesus loves me unconditionally, and my faith in Him is all I need for salvation. Because of that, I can build on this. And he says, I'm on that faith now because I have faith. And this is kind of what Thomas talked about. Now I'm going to try to do what's right and not do what's wrong. And you say, well, that sounds like a work salvation. Not at all. If that's, if that's work salvation, then my marriage is a works marriage. It's not based on relationship. Because I work at doing what my wife would want me to do. But here's the key. It's not because that earns my marriage. It's not because that earns my relationship. It's because of my love for her that I strive to do what she wants me to do, and I strive not to do the things that she doesn't want me to do. Now, does that mean I'm perfect? Ask her. I won't, I won't, I won't <laughs> spoil that for you. I can guarantee that the answer will not be that, yes, John is perfect. 
Uh, there were, as I've shared before, some of those things on the Ten Commandments of Leah that would that would be on my Ten Commandments of her is thou shalt not eat hungry man, thou shalt not bite your fingers, thou shalt not, let's see, what are, what are some of them? Not my fingers, that sounded like vicious, I don't just bite my fingers, my fingernails, that's more specific. Um, thou shalt not uh, tease me, thou shalt not post pictures of me on Facebook, now I've been really good. I've been good at that one. I just have to tell you, I have some doozies. Who have I showed the picture of the snorkeling Leah to? Just Don. Okay, just Don. So, so far, uh, did I show it to you too? Oh, you want me to? Well, catch me after church. I'm sure I, will. I, will, I will fall to the temptation. But I was so tempted. Now listen, if you understand, I control this screen, right? And I have the picture in my pocket. So there was a 10-minute bout of temptation that happened at the back of the church this morning, where I was looking at the picture of Leah in her scuba gear, and look, I'm not scuba, snorkeling gear, and looking at the screen and thinking, it would be a perfect illustration. <laughs> it would fall so perfectly between one, point one and point two. So all that to say this, I am not perfect. I don't get it right all the time. I don't always please her. But my virtue in our marriage, my doing right and not doing wrong, is not a result of her forcing it. It's a result of my love for her. Her love for me and my love for her constrains me to live a little differently than I would if I wasn't married to her. Now, sounds, sounds familiar, right? Paul said, the love of Christ constrains me. Thank you. But so I don't forget. This has nothing to do with the point, but I will forget if I don't say it. There is no Sunday school next Sunday, okay? It has nothing to do with Leah's snorkeling gear. But if you show up, <laughs> if you show up at 9 o'clock next Sunday, we will put you to work. That's what's going to happen. You're going to be setting up tables, decorating for, uh, for uh, homecoming. And I do want to mention, while I'm, while I'm sidetracked, I'll stay sidetracked for just a second. Next Sunday is our 110th homecoming service. Now, here's the cool thing. That is a lot of history for a church. We're going to celebrate that history. We're going to talk about that history. Pastor Tom, who was the pastor here for nearly 20 years, will be preaching for us next Sunday morning. But I don't want it to just be a rearview mirror service. I'm excited about what's going to happen this year and next year and five years from now and at our 120th celebration and our 150th celebration and I expect you all to be here at our 150th so figure that out for me make sure it happens 40 years from this Sunday I expect you to be there but here's the point here's the point God has used this church in amazing ways and God continues to use this church in amazing ways and I want you to be a part of what God's doing in our church. So, so last thing I want to say about next Sunday, no Sunday school, homecoming service, chicken next door. And listen to this, you don't even have to bring anything. All you got to do is help clean up. We got chicken, we got potato salad, and beans on the way. It's going to be a good meal. It's going to be a good time to fellowship with people that have been gone and are coming back. But I want you to invite somebody brand new. And not only do I want you to invite somebody brand new, I want you to come expecting to give not only in your regular offering, but next Sunday we're going to take up a special offering for our new church sign. Say, so why are you so worried about that church sign? We have roughly 10,000 people drive in front of our church every day. Now, right now, the sign looks good. The sign looks okay. But you know what that sign says? That church is old. It's been there a long time, just like that sign has been there a long time. Now, I'm not talking about the age of the people inside. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm talking about the actual physical age. Now, here's my heart. Here's my goal. Our church shouldn't be a museum of what we once were. It should be a shining light of what God's called us to be. And so that's what that sign means. When we upgrade that sign and we can put messages on that sign that will draw attention of those 10,000 people driving by, God's going to bless that. So that's why we keep harping on that sign. So just give and I'll shut up about it, right? That's, that's the deal. No, I'm just... I'm only kidding. As I've said before, as I've said multiple times, when I ask for an offering, it's not because we need you to give. It's because I want you to get it on the blessing that God's going to bless you with 
when you do it. So that being said, all of that from one note that said, what about Sunday school? No, no more notes will ever be passed to me again. There went 10 minutes of your life that you'll never get back. Everyone, there's going to be, there's going to be like a, a, a guards up here blocking. Don't hand them any notes. They'll go so long on whatever you say. But the point is this, no Sunday school do come next week. So we're talking about perseverance. Perseverance. About what it means to continue, what it means to keep going. And as I was saying, the, the, the line between knowledge, true knowledge of Jesus Christ, and, and like what we talked about, and I, I thought it was funny on this cruise. So, so one thing about our vacation, the reason we go on a cruise, Leah mandates that no internet pa pa uh, package can be bought, that my phone gets locked away, and it's not in my hand, and I'm not checking emails, and I'm not answering calls, because she wants my attention. Now, she only wants it for a day. And then she's like, go you get your phone, leave me alone. No, not really. But the point is, our first cruise, about, about 10 years ago, we went on our first cruise. Is that right? Or is that just like, oh, she doesn't know either. We did, we did, the years are a blur now. They've just run together. But seven, eight, ten years ago, somewhere in that range, uh, we went on our first cruise. And the entire time, kind of what I talked about a few weeks ago, was us sharing stories about our lives that we didn't know about each other before. Right? That was the time. That was, our, that was getting to know each other in a more intimate way. But then as time went on, the next few cruises, it was less about who we used to be and more about our life now. And this time, it was more about our life that, that we've had and our girls and our daughters and how they're growing up and how this is the debate that happens. We should just bring them. And then we see someone else's kids and we're like, no, we shouldn't just bring them. Our kids do not do well on boats. We're going to just leave them home. But it goes from what we once were without each other, our lives together. And in this cruise, the neat thing was we spent a lot of, a lot of time talking about what's coming. What are the years coming? And, and as a young person, everything is scary. You look forward in life and you think about uh, kids and you think, how could I ever do that? I can remember being terrified of walking the aisle to marry my wife. I was like, I gotta stand in front of people. And what if I say the wrong words? And what if I drop the ring? And what if I just start sweating really bad or something happens? And, and now I'm up here every Sunday. But, um, but I can remember when everything about the future scared me. But because of our relationship, because that we know each other personally, and we've walked through dark days and we've walked through bright days, we've walked on mountaintops and we've walked in valleys, because of those moments, now we look into the future with hope and say, whatever it is that we're going to face, God is going to take care of us and God's going to provide for us. And here's where we are today. We talked about knowledge. We talked about how God sustains us. We talked about self-control. Because we know God, we can control ourselves. And today, I can continue because I know Jesus Christ. Because of Jesus, I don't have to fear tomorrow. I don't have to fear circumstances. I don't have to be afraid because I've walked with him before. I walked with him yesterday and he took care of me. And I, he walked with me today and he took care of me. And I know tomorrow he's going to take care of me then too. And so that's perseverance. That's what we're going to talk about. Now, I, 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 I didn't intend on sharing this. Um, many of you know Otis Burkhan. And if you don't think you know Otis Burkhan, you still do know Otis Burkhan. He was the kind gentleman, clean cut. He had the haircut that I wanted but never had, um, at least not for the last 10 years. <laughs> Wore a gold bracelet and was the first person to greet you every time you came in on Sunday morning. He said, I love you. He said, I appreciate you. He gave you a hug, he gave you a bulletin, and he made sure you knew that you were loved when you walked in. Well, Otis, just a couple weeks ago, uh, due to circumstances outside of his control, had to go into a more um, assisted living arrangement. Um, now, Otis was pretty distraught when he went. Otis was pretty frustrated when he was going. Uh, and, and I was, I, I'll just tell you the truth, I had a close relationship with Otis, a different kind of relationship. If you don't know about Otis, Otis was Truett Cathy, the uh, Chick-fil-A um, creator, whatever, I don't know, uh, organizer. He was the guy, the Chick-fil-A guy. He passed away a few years ago. Him and Otis were co-Sunday school teachers back in Georgia. Otis was a part of Charles Stanley's church, was a Sunday school teacher in Charles Stanley's church years ago. Otis had some wisdom that was just below the surface, and when you spend some real time with him, it really was an enriching experience. It really was an amazing experience. And because of that, I had a close relationship with Otis. In fact, uh, a few times I sat down with him at breakfast and I said, Otis, 
You may not be able to do much physically anymore, but I'm a young guy. A lot of the stuff that's in the dashboard for me is in the rearview mirror for you, and you can give me some perspective that I don't have. And I, I gleaned some amazing wisdom and some things from Otis that I couldn't have gotten from any other source. And I'll tell you this way. Otis was an answer to the prayer that I prayed when my dad passed away. I said, God, if you take away my pastor, you've got to give me some other, other guys. And Otis was one of those guys. And I, so, so you have to understand, when Otis left, selfishly, because the best thing was for Otis to go to Tampa. He's in Tampa. I've got his address if you want to visit him. The best thing for Otis was to go to Tampa. But selfishly, he said, God, you should have just left Otis a couple more years. He wasn't ready to go. But here's what Otis said. He sent me a letter. He said, in all that's going on in my life, God is working miracles. Not only in my life, but in our family. Um, I'm going to jump down just a little bit. He said, uh, in all that has happened, my family has grown, uh, has drawn clo even closer to the Lord. And all we all praise God for what has happened. Now I take a whole new group to minister to. So he's literally started a Bible study in his uh, assisted living location. So don't worry, Otis is back to Sunday school teaching like he always wants to. Um, he's, he's doing what God's called him to do. And he goes on further. He says, in fact, we, have, we all help each other and I'm forever bringing up the saving grace of Jesus Christ. To God be the glory of the great things he hath done. You're in my prayer and locked in my heart. You said, why did you share? Why did you read that letter from Otis? This is, this is a letter to me, and I thought, well, maybe he wouldn't want me to read it. Maybe he wouldn't want me. And so I, I cut out some parts of it. But the big point of it was this. Otis wanted us to know God's still good. This was not the plan Otis had. This was not Otis's desire. He wasn't ready to go to Tampa. Things changed in his life, and those circumstances he couldn't control forced him into a situation that he might have not been ready for or may have not wanted. But despite that, the perseverance, this is what I want you to understand, Otis knew that God had a plan when God brought him down to Austria in the first place. Otis knew that God had a plan when his wife was taken away years ago and Otis was left here. Otis knew that God had a plan for his everyday life while he was here. Otis knows that God has a plan for our church, but to take it even a step further, Otis knows that even in some of his darkest days, God is at work and God has a plan. I want you to understand, this is perseverance. This is the knowledge of Jesus Christ played out in a years after years after years of serving and following him. There is no other way to perseverance but growing to know him and know that he loves you. You know what that means? Sometimes it's going to hurt. Sometimes it's going to cost a lot. Sometimes it's not going to be what you wanted or expected. Sometimes it's going to completely derail everything that you had planned. But what we've got to understand is that Jesus Christ has a plan. And if I continue to walk with him, he's going to use it in my life. So this morning, as we just examined three short points, I want us to really think about this idea of perseverance. James chapter 1 is where we're going to spend all of our time this morning. I'll read a, a verse out of Job in just a little while, but we won't spend long there at all. James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. Now, I do have to give you a disclaimer. The numbers for the verses on the screen are right. The numbers on your paper are wrong. The only explanation I have for you is the numbers on the paper were pre-vacation. The numbers on the screen are post-vacation. So take that for what you will, but the ones on the screen are right, the ones on the paper are wrong. You make adjustments as needed. Um, I was just going to say add one to all of the ones on the paper, but even that's not right, so I'm not sure what I was doing with the numbering a couple weeks ago, but they're wrong, so use the screen. That's, that's the key. James chapter 1, verse 2, the Bible says this, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. God, I thank you so much for having a purpose and having a plan and having a desire to, to use us, God. Lord, you didn't need us. God, it's because you loved us that you allow us to be a part of your plan. God, I pray that you just help us to be faithfully committed to you, knowing you, following you, and because of that, having perseverance in you. Bless our time together, Lord. Bless your word. I pray that you'd make it clear and help it to change our minds and change our hearts today so that our actions will reflect those. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first thing I want to talk about
to talk about is this, the test. The test. Point number one is the test. When we talk about perseverance, it only comes with testing. That's what the Bible teaches right here. The only way you're going to get perseverance, the only way you're going to get endurance is by testing. Now that stands to reason, if you've ever tried to run, right? So, so if you've run every day for a year, when you get on the treadmill to run, it's no longer a chore. So, so Brian Beecher, uh, Brian Guevara, so that everybody knows, Brian picks me up faithfully at least three days a week. I'd say that's a, probably an average. He faithfully picks me up when I don't find a way to squirrel out of it or uh, complain my way out of it. And we go to the Berlin YMCA. And he gets on a treadmill and I get on an elliptical and off we go for an hour. Now the first time that Brian took me to the Y, there was a distinct feeling for the next couple days after I went to the Y. Now here's the problem. Brian said, well, I run for an hour, but don't feel like you got to go an hour. But John doesn't do that, right? Like, you know me well enough to know if I'm going to do something, I do something all the way. And so I got on that elliptical, and I was burning it for an hour. To the point, people were coming up and saying, you are a big guy to run that long. Like, you should, like, people were taking notice that you probably shouldn't be running as much as you're running right now. I'm okay, I'm fine. And the reality was I did feel kind of fine. I wasn't out of breath, I wasn't tired, but the moment I got in the car, my legs just wanted to be straight, right? They didn't want to bend, and these muscles at the back of my legs, these tendons, decided they wanted to tighten up. And so for the next day or so, it was like, are you okay? Yeah, I'm just walking normal. There's nothing wrong about anything that I'm doing, and don't take notice of it. And she, we had been taking the girls to the Y and practicing basketball, and she said, hey, do you want to go to the Y? And I'm like, well, it's uh, too nice out today. Let's just stay home. <laughs> I make these excuses because what I had done is I had overextended. I wasn't, my endurance wasn't where my brain was. Now, Brian has been going, how long have you been going now, Brian? Like six months? Yeah. Probably. Something like that. Yeah. Probably more than that. I'm, I'm being conservative. But he's been going a long time. Uh, been losing a ton of weight, doing a great job. But Brian has been going a long time. And so Brian can go every day. In fact, one day, I think he was just rubbing it in. I'll be honest. I'm sorry, Brian. I shouldn't tell him from the pulpit. He texts me and he says, I just ran to the Y. Or jog. He said jog. He didn't say ran. I said, then what? Took a nap? Like, you got there and you guys have a bed? Now that my workout's over, let me use a lounge chair. He run like four, was it four or five miles from his house to the Y and then run an hour? I was like... People like you are why I can't go to the gym. No, I'm not going to <laughs> just, just showing off, right? But the difference was, if Brian had tried to do that on day one, someone probably would have had to rescue him somewhere on Beery, right? That's probably the case. He would have been sitting on the corner, huffing and puffing, and somebody might have had to come and, come and rescue him. There might have been an ER visit that day if he had done that the first day. But that hard work and that pain and that trial, that testing of his endurance, built the endurance. There was no other way. There was no pill he could take. There was no uh, treatment he could have. There was nothing else he could do to build that endurance except for go through the pain, go through the testing, go through the difficulty. You see where this applies in our life? The reason that God allows suffering the reason that God allows pain in your life, the reason that God allows testing and trials in your life, it's not by accident, it's not by chance, it's not outside of his, his control. It's because the only way that he can build endurance in you is for you to feel a little pain, to pay the price, to have some difficult times, to have some tests, to have some trials. And so I want to talk about a few things that, when we talk about the test. The first thing I want you to realize is that trials are coming. It's not an if. It's not a maybe. It's not a possibility. There will be trials. I want to read to you Job chapter 14. Job always had such an optimistic way of thinking about things and putting things. But what he says here is true. Job chapter 14 verse 1 says this. Man who is born of woman is short-lived and full of turmoil. Doesn't that sound exciting? Isn't that like motivational speaker 101? Your life is going to be short and difficult. Go live it. Right? There's our challenge today. Everybody, let's go. Short life, hard work. Let's do it. But here's what Joe understood. Life 
is a small, small sample in comparison with eternity. Our life down here, now, now here's the thing, whether you're Christian, whether you're Buddhist, whether you're atheist, whether you don't believe in anything, you will have trials and troubles. So the difference for a Christian is that our trials and our troubles have purpose and meaning and they lead to something. That's the thing. If, if, if you watch, <laughs> so Lee and I have been watching some documentaries, watching some um, biographies of different people, and as you watch people that lived in the world and they start to face difficult times, one of two things happens regularly in their lives. Number one, they turn to like a hedonistic lifestyle. It's all about how much enjoyment can I get, how much pleasure can I get, how much, uh, how much can I enjoy my life while it's good because bad times are coming. Let me just get as much good as I can because I'm going to die before long. So I'm going to drink, I'm going to do drugs, I'm going to have all kinds of terrible relationships, I'm going to do all these things because if I do those things, that's the best thing I can get in life. Right? Or another popular way that seems to happen is that hard times come in life and people start to say, well, there's just no point. There's just no point. And it becomes more and more prevalent that people begin to take their own lives because they say there's just nothing, you know, there's nothing in life that could be worth the pain that I am facing. There could be nothing in life that would be worth the trial that I'm facing. There's nothing in life that would be worth this level of testing. But here's what the Bible says. The trying of your faith brings perseverance. Here's what he's saying. If you want to be mature in Christ, if you want to fulfill what he's called you to do, if you want to live up to the calling that he's given you, this is part of the deal. You've got to go through difficult times. You've got to go through trials. And here's the exciting part. As we go through those trials and difficult times, they have a purpose. I want you to understand that the trials are going to test you. We see that in verse 3, the first part there says, consider, uh, well, I'll read 2 through verse 3. It says, Consider all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith. Make no mistake, when you face a trial, when you face a difficulty, it's there to test your faith. Do you really believe that God loves you? Do you, re do you really believe that God saved you? Do you really believe that God's in control and yet God's all powerful and that God has your your best interest at heart. Do you really believe that God desires to be your Savior? If you believe that, it should play out in your life. Now, now I'm going to step on toes, just as fair warning. Talk a in if you're, if you're afraid. Just get, get ready. If you're not willing to trust God through the trial that you face on earth, do you really trust Him for salvation from hell? Think about that. If, you, if you're not trusting him to get you through a money problem or a health problem or a family problem, if you can't trust him with what he's given you here on earth, are you really trusting him with eternity or is it just a game that you're playing? Let me tell you something. If this is just a game, if this is just something we do on Sunday, I would not devote my life to it. I would not give my time to it. I would not give my family for it. I would not spend my entire life serving God if it was just for a game on Sunday. Let me tell you something. The reality of what Christianity is, is that it is the end all and be all of human life. Whether you admit it or not, whether you know it or not, Jesus Christ is the purpose for you. He's given the potential in you. He is the drive in you. He is the reason for testing. He is the purpose for everything you face, and he is the strength for everything you will endure. If you don't have Jesus, you're doing it wrong. Simple as that. You say, I'm doing what wrong? Life. If you are not walking with Jesus Christ, if you can't trust him with your money and your time and your energy and your health and your family, let me tell you something, you're doing it wrong. Because the Bible says, he that gave his own son for our sins, what would he withhold from you? What good thing would he withhold from you? The obvious answer is nothing. There's nothing that he wouldn't give for you. And so here's what we come back to. If you are facing a difficulty, a testing, a trial, if you're facing various trials like the Bible says you will, it's not because God doesn't love you. It's not because God doesn't know. It's because you're all loving, all powerful, all knowing creator and savior and friend knows there's no other way to accomplish in you what he desires to accomplish in you. That's the reality. 
That's the reality. We check the air for me. I forgot to turn it back on. I'm starting to get that meat locker feeling up here, so I know that some of you are uncomfortable as well. If I'm not sweating, it means you are freezing. So that's that's we got to make an adjustment. I apologize uh, for that. So the test comes from every angle. The test, uh, the trials are going to test you, but I want you to realize you should be joyful in trials because we know they have purpose. Consider it all joy. You say that sounds like a crazy person. It really does. Consider your cancer. Consider your bankruptcy. Consider your foreclosure. Consider your repossession. Consider your divorce. Consider your, um, your child that's gone astray. Consider them joy because the trying of your faith brings perseverance. Say, that sounds ridiculous. Let me remind you. God is in control and he has a plan for your life. Sometimes Satan desires to convince you that you've messed it up. Let me tell you something. Let me, let, let me let you in on a hint. If you could mess it up, I already did at 15. I did enough before I was 16 years old that if I could disqualify myself from being a Christian, it was done way back there. Let me tell you, it didn't take long either, just a couple weeks. But let me tell you something. It's never been about me being good enough. It's never been about you being good enough. You never will be strong enough. You never will be mature enough. You never will be complete enough. The maturity of a Christian is this. I've walked with Jesus and he's protected me and he's taken care of me. So in this moment that I don't have an answer, I'm going to hide behind him. That is spiritual maturity. Not that I can fight harder because I can never fight harder. Not that I can do better, because I will never do better. Jesus in me is the only hope that I've got. Let me tell you something. Jesus in you is the only hope that you've got. This is perseverance. I need Jesus. So we know the test. Not only, not only do I want to talk about the test, this is the product. I want you to realize that we are tested and tried for a specific result. Look at the last part of verse 3 here. It says, uh, the testing of your faith, listen to what it says, produces endurance. It produces endurance. So, so here's the thing. If you look at Scripture and you kind of study the life of Paul, Paul spent a lot of time talking and praying that he would continue, that he would finish, that he would persevere, that he would follow Christ to the end. It was his desire, it was his concern that he would not be set aside. Or he would not be laid aside, or he would not be um, separated, or, or fall out of the ministry of Jesus Christ. In other words, his desire in life was that I get to the end of my life, and I can say, I've been following Jesus all these years. That's what Paul would talk about a lot. And so here, what, he, what, what we see here in James, James says this, that the trying of your faith is going to bring what Paul was always talking about. To endure to the end, the only chance that you'll endure to the end is by enduring the trials and the tests that face you. You say, well, that sounds like it's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Like you have to beat the trials to beat the trials. Well, it sort of is, honestly. Here's kind of how it works. When you walk with God and see that he is taking care of you, the next time a difficulty comes, even if it's a bigger one, you have a tendency to say, well, you did it last time. I have no reason to doubt that he'll do it again. Right? Think about your relationships in life. I want you to think about that. We all have two kinds of relationships. We have the kind of people that we can trust with our lives. Right? If they say they're going to do something, if they say they're going to be somewhere, if they say they're going to pick you up, if they say they're going to do whatever, you can just, you can mark it down. It's going to happen. The trustworthy kind. Now, how did they get that trust? It's a track record, right? The last time they said they'd do something, they did it. The last time I needed help, they helped me. The last time I reached out, they were there for me. And then we've got the other kind, right? Maybe a sibling. Now, I'm not saying anything, sisters. If you're listening online, I'm not talking about you. Don't get all mad at me. I'll see you Wednesday. Might be in trouble now. But um, maybe, maybe a sibling, maybe a friend, maybe an acquaintance. But every time you go to them, it's the kind of person that you say, no, you're sure. You're sure you're going to do this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you write it down? 
Will you make sure you write it down? In fact, can we get a contract that you're going to be here when the airplane gets there, you're going to be there, and I'm not going to be sitting waiting for you. Oh, don't worry about it. It's okay. How many of you got a friend like that? Or a family member like that? Or an acquaintance like that? That every time they say they're going to come through, you've always got plan B, right? You'd be dumb not to because they're not going to come through for you. People you can't trust. Now, how did they get that reputation? Track record, right? <coughs> what they've done in your life. Now, I'm going to ask you this. How many times have you failed yourself? It's a lot for me. How many times have you said, I'm not going to do this anymore? And you turned around and did it. Or I'm not going to go here anymore. You turned around and went there. Or I'm not going to be this kind of person. Or I would never say this. Or I would never do that. And then you surprise yourself with your own wickedness. Right? It's pretty, it's pretty depressing when you really think about it. As you look back over the years of your life, I don't have to have you raise hands. Because everybody in here, the person who's failed you most, is looking in the mirror. It's the truth. It's the reality. Your biggest enemy has been yourself. Now here's the thing. That's the track record. Think about that track record. You've always failed yourself. I want you to think about the opposite side of that. How many times have you went to God and he failed you? Let me tell you something. He hasn't failed me yet. Say, so, well, sometimes I pray for something and, and he doesn't answer. Let me tell you something. The wisdom of God as a heavenly father is knowing that even though you're asking for something, it may not be what's best for you. You know, my kids... We used to have uh, passes to SeaWorld when we lived in Texas. Now, you got a picture of Lily, who's now my 10-year-old, was three at the time. And Abby, who is now my 8-year-old, was one at the time. Now, Lily, she's getting better. She's gotten older. But patience is not her strong suit. So never fails. We would get in the car, get on I-35 going from Austin to San Antonio. And about five minutes into the trip, there was this big Walmart on the side of the road that you could see, and man, to a three-year-old, it just looked like heaven. There was pools outside, and swim rings, and all this Texas stuff, and flowers, and she thought, man, that is the place we want to go. And so, never failed. Every time we went to SeaWorld, we'd get on the road, and five minutes down the road, she'd say, Dad, 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 just stop. Can we please just go to Walmart? Let's just go to Walmart. We don't have to drive all the way to SeaWorld. Let's just go to Walmart instead. We can go look around for a little bit, and then we can go home. And I would say, Lily, if we go to Walmart, you're going to miss out on so much fun stuff that we have planned at SeaWorld. Now, here's the thing. Never did we get to SeaWorld, and she'd say, wish we were at Walmart. <laughs> The why you took me all the way to Sea World, Sea Shamu, and all he does is jump and splash me, and it's just the most fun I've ever had in my life. I don't know why I didn't just stop at Walmart like I wanted you to. <laughs> Think about how that applies to us as Christians. God, just stop. Just I don't want to feel any more pain anymore. I don't want to go through this anymore. I don't want to wait. I don't want to be patient. Just answer my prayer right now. Give me exactly what I want, and I'll be happy. You know how long that would last? Just about a second. The same amount of time it would have lasted if I stopped and took Lily into Walmart. Well, they, they wouldn't have satisfied her. They wouldn't have been what she wanted. And here's the thing. God knows what you need. God knows what he has in store. And God knows that we are woefully immature. Right? God knows that we'll beg for things that will hurt us. God knows that we'll cry rather than endure just because the moment becomes more valuable than the lifetime. And he loves us too much to let us have that. He loves us too much to let us do that. And so here's the reality. This track record is what builds perseverance. Because I know that God took care of me before, I know that it will take care of me again. The testing and the trying of your faith not only brings a specific result, it brings endurance. It gives you the ability to continue, the, to carry on, to go further. Because the last time you had a difficulty, he brought you through it. And you know he's going to do it again. So we talk about the test, we talk about the product, and here's the result. You say, well, I'm still not convinced. Why in the world do I need endurance? Why in the world do I need to persevere? Why don't I just give up now and just get it over with? Why should I continue? Here's what the Bible says about it. Verse number four, the Bible says this. <laughs> and let endurance have its perfect result. I want you to understand something. There is a plan for endurance. 
It's not just there to, to get you to the next level. It's not just there so you can overcome the next obstacle. It's not just there so you can go the next year or the next day or the next month. It's there for a purpose. And that endurance is going to bring us three things. The first thing is it says this. Endurance will perfect us. Once you see that in verse 4, it says, so that you may be perfect. Now I want you to understand that this word perfect means this. Brought to our end, finished. Wanting nothing. Listen to these last two words. Full grown, mature. How many times have you heard someone in the world say, the church is just a bunch of hypocrites? Can we even argue with it? You want to know how we can combat that? Be full grown. Be mature. Say, so what do you mean by that? Well, think about it this way. With maturity, expectations change because that track record changes and because that person changes. So, for example, I just talked about Lily, who could not last five minutes in the car without wanting to go to Walmart instead of SeaWorld. Well, now, 10-year-old Lily, we get in the car to go to her grandmother's house, which is probably about a 10-hour drive. She gets in, settles in, and does what she has to do. You know why she does that? She knows what's on the other side now. She understands the trip. She understands the journey. And so instead of having to say to Lily, Lily, be quiet. Lily, be quiet. Now we have to say, Mariah, be quiet. Mariah, be quiet. <laughs> Caleb, be quiet. Literally, we passed the B Ridge exit. So we got off on Clark, passed B Ridge. Caleb said, oh, we're there. We're almost there. We're to Mimi's house. I said, no, we're not. And then roughly every 15 minutes for the next 10 hours. When are we going to be there? And so I finally told her, let Abby set a timer on your iPad. Now, I thought this was genius, right? She could watch the clock tick down. But I failed to remember that she knows how to set a one-minute timer. So now, every 15 minutes, I had, when are we going to be there? But every single minute, ding, 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 ding. Dad, the timer's done. Are we there? No, we're not there. Quit changing the timer to one minute. It needs to be 10 hours. The timer's done. Dad, are we there? No, we're not there. You say, what do you mean? What are you, what are you trying to say? The maturity of my 10-year-old changes my perception of her. Let me repeat that. The maturity of my 10-year-old changes my perception of her. Now, now so much so that I am going to be driving with my 10-year-old and 8-year-old an extra 12 hours to go see their other grandmother. Now, if you told me I had to do that with the 6-year-old and the 4-year-old, you, you couldn't write a check big enough. <laughs> me, by myself, with Caitlin and Mariah, all the way up to Kentucky with nothing to do but look, look at the road, no chance. But the older two, their maturity allows them relationships, influence, impact that the younger two don't have. And it's only, it's not because I don't love Caitlin, it's not because I don't love Mariah, it's just because of maturity. Now let me tell you something, the sphere of influence in your life the people that God's put into your life, he desires to show the love of Jesus Christ through you. But the only time that's going to happen, now, let, let, let me just, you figure it out. If you're a Christian and you're going through, let's say you got a financial problem, and the people that God's put into your sphere of influence, they're around you and you're just complaining. Well, I just don't know where I'm going to get the money from. I just don't know how this is going to work. I just don't know how this is going to happen. I just, you know, I'm just so afraid of what's going to happen. You know what those people around you hear? The same as me. That's the same problem I would have. If I was in that financial situation, that's what I would say. And let me tell you this. The mature Christian that says, well, listen, I don't know the answer, but I don't have to stress about it because I know God has a plan and God has a purpose. And I'm doing what he called me to do, so he's going to take care of me. You want to know what kind of impact that makes? Because no longer is it, well, they're just the same as me. They're saying, he's either crazy or he knows something I don't know. You know what the difference was? Maturity. The trying of your faith makes you mature, makes you full grown. 
lets that sphere of influence that you have impact people for the cause of Christ. Second thing he says here, he says, endurance will complete us. Let's look at verse number four. He says, and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete. Now listen, James loves to do this. He's got a couple words here that mean sort of close to the same thing. And as we lazy Americans like to do, we read three words and we, sit and we just say, well, he just means mature. Just means he's going to complete us. Just means, you know, that, just the general idea. But all three of them carry some different connotations that I want to bring out here. So first he said it'll, it'll perfect us. Next he said endurance will complete us. I want you to see the definition of that word complete. It says without defect, free from sin, faultless. How many of you did I just describe, right? That's us, free from sin, defect free, faultless. <clears throat> Nobody. Nobody. In fact, the Bible says our righteousness, our, our, our claim to fame of how good we are is filthy rags. The only righteousness we have is imputed from Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ, at the point of salvation, put on your account the righteousness of him who lived through temptation and lived through trials and lived through tribulations and did it without any defect or fault. I want you to understand something. Remember earlier I described this, that as a mature Christian, it's not that I stand with my sword and say, I can fight you off, devil. It's I see the devil come in and I say, let me hide behind Jesus Christ because I know I can't fight on my own. Right? That's maturity as a Christian. So here's what he's saying. He's not saying that you will try harder and be better and get better. He's saying that you will be more conformed to the image of Jesus Christ who you hide behind in times of trouble. You should think about that. You will be more like Christ. The righteousness that will show in you is not your righteousness. It's his righteousness. So as he says here, he says, first he'll perfect you. That means he's going to do the work in you to mature you, to grow you up, to make you full grown. But then he goes on, he says, he will complete us. He will remove defects. He will free us from sin. He will make us faultless. But it won't be by our efforts. Let me tell you something. Every time I've ever tried to be better, I've been worse. Every time I've tried to fight harder, I've failed more. Here's what I've learned as an adult, as a follower of Jesus Christ. When Satan comes after me, I have to get behind Jesus Christ. There's no other option. There's no other hope that I would win other than Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. When we are mature, when we have endurance, when we start turning to Christ as an instinct every time we face difficulty, it doesn't make you better. It makes Jesus shine more. Let me tell you something. This should be your aim, and it's mine. As your pastor, my aim is not that you'll say, he was so funny or he was so smart or I loved his sermons. It would be that you would say, I see Jesus. I don't see him. You say, well, what do you mean by that? When I face difficult times, when I face trials, when I face things that I don't understand, that I don't know how to fight, I don't know how to beat, I don't know how to win, I don't want to fight harder, I want to hide better behind Jesus Christ. And you say, well, why would you do that? Because I want to encourage you to do the same. Because the only hope we have against the devil, against sin, against self, against temptation, is Jesus Christ. And that's what he's saying in the second verse. He's not saying that you're going to be perfect. He's saying that I'll see less of you and more of Jesus Christ. That's what he's calling us to. You say, well, what's the third thing? Here's the third thing he says. Endurance will supply what we lack. I want you to understand, this is what the Bible says. So, so that you may be perfect and complete. Listen to this phrase. Lacking in nothing. That phrase is actually a well-used phrase. And here's what it means. Nothing left behind. Nothing inferior. Nothing failing. You know what? Peter said this as well. He said that all things that pertain unto life and godliness have been supplied by Jesus Christ. Here's what he's saying. All three of these points make the same point from different angles. Jesus Christ is the answer for who you need to be today, who you're called to be tomorrow, who you're going to grow into in maturity. It's Jesus Christ. I'm going to hide behind him when sin comes against me. The trials come, and the first time I hide behind him and he protects me, I start to learn, this is how I win. Right? This is how I win. You know, it's funny. My daughter, Abby, loves playing video games. Now... I used to have to just pretend to play. So, so she's gone through the phases of video game playing. When she first started playing, I would hand her a controller that wasn't on. And then I would play against the computer. And she would just sit there and push the button, and she thought she was doing good. After a few months of that, she was probably about five or six, 
she realized that I push this way and they go that way. Like something's not right, something's going on. And so I had to start turning the controller on. That was the phase that lasted about two years where we played basketball on my, on my video game and she would get the ball, throw it in, and launch it across the court every single play for a 20 minute game. If you want to get bored, play video games with a six-year-old. The most boring thing ever, because every single play looked the same. She throws it in, she launches it down the court, zero points. And then what would inevitably happen, every 15th or 20th shot, the ball goes in, and she dances around for 10 minutes and pauses the game, celebrating her 3 to 25 <laughs> loss, because she hit that one shot. But something happened this year. She graduated from that stage. And now she's gotten to the point where she's figured out how to beat me. Now don't tell her I said this. I can't, I used to give her the best team and I play as the worst. And all of a sudden I did that and she killed me. It's like, okay. And she said, Dad, were you really trying? Uh, no, not 100%, but I really was trying. And so I started trying to get even teams. And I noticed something about Abby is that she would find something to exploit and beat me with, right? She would either figure out that the guy in the corner, I wouldn't guard him, so she'd send a guy in the corner and shoot a three every time and make the three. Or she'd find one guy that she knew how to get his timing right, and she'd just shoot the same shot over and over and over again until she beat me. And she'd find some way that she knew she could win. It's pretty smart, right? This is endurance. This is perseverance. This is continuing in Christ. Let me tell you something. The first time the devil comes at you, or temptation comes at you, or trials come at you, and you just get behind Jesus and say, I'm just hungering down. God, you take care of this. You're going to realize, hey, that worked. And so the next time, all right, Jesus, here it comes again. It worked again. And before long, there's no other play in your playbook. You don't know what that's called? Spiritual maturity. You say, what do you mean by that? When no longer do you try to fight your own battles, when no longer do you try to be good enough, or hard, try hard enough, or be better, or, or better yourself in some way that the world tells you to be, when you start to realize it's all Jesus Christ, every moment, every day, every trial, everything I face, I need Jesus. That's what he's called you to be. To be conformed to the image of the Son. You want to know the best way to do that? I buy him. I'm the one. As our musicians come, I wanted to talk to you today. Maybe you're here today and you've never begun a relationship with Jesus Christ. You've never begun that, that, that relationship that I've been talking about all day. Let me tell you something. If you've never accepted Christ... There's no level of effort, there's no level of trying, there's no level of doing that will save you, not only from what you face here on earth, but will save you for eternity from your sin. Today, if you're here and you've never accepted Christ, I want you to know it's as simple as ABC. It's A, admit that you're a sinner. Listen, we already did that this morning. We raised our hands, everybody said, I'm a sinner. We've all failed, we've all fallen short. We all are broken. Admit that you're a sinner. B, is believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. Thomas said it right in the, in the baptistry this morning, that Jesus was the only way to his salvation. And that leads us to C, confess that Jesus is the only way to salvation. I can't try hard enough. I can't be good enough. I can't do enough. I can't work at it. I don't, I don't have anything to offer. All I can do is surrender. All I can do is repent and turn to him. That's salvation. See, that seems so complicated. I don't understand all of that. Maybe that's you today. I invite you to come down. I'd love to spend just a few minutes talking one-on-one -on -one and explaining what each one of those means. I challenge you today. Don't go home wondering what it means to have a relationship with Christ. You've got an opportunity today. Maybe you're here today and you do have a relationship with Him. You know Him and you follow Him, but you say, man, I don't have that perseverance I don't have that faith. I don't have that maturity that comes from knowing he's going to take care of me. Let me challenge you. Today, commit to following and hiding behind him. He's our only hope. Let's all stand as we sing. <laughs>
Amen. Well, we've got a couple orders of business. You may be seated unless your name is Thomas or Kayleen. Thomas and Kayleen, come on up here and stand by me. So I, 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 let me tell you something. If this doesn't get you excited and get you going, you don't understand why we're here. I'll just say it that way. If new people come in and come in to know Christ and come in to follow Christ and come in to join with our church family doesn't get you going... Listen, we need to talk because you don't understand what we're trying to do. We don't, you don't understand what we've been placed here to do. So Thomas and Kaylee, like I said, they've been coming. Uh, December was your first time, right? Yeah. Near the end of December. And uh, they came, and, and one of the first things Thomas said to me was, I already know we disagree about some things. <laughs> I said, all right, all right, slow down. We'll, we'll get there, we'll get there. But anyhow, that all started a conversation where we got to know Thomas and Kayleen and, and also our Indian waiter at, uh, the, what was the name of that place? Tika. Tika, check Tika out. This is unpaid commercial. They, it's good food. Uh, but we got to know the waiter as well. Uh, but but over, over talking through some questions and talking through some things that maybe we aren't 100% in agreement on, but we can have fellowship in Jesus Christ, Thomas and Kayleen have been praying over the past few weeks, and they've decided that they want to join with our church family. And so Thomas has been back. You don't have any choice in that. He's already in. He's got, he, got, he got in through the pool, and so you, you can't block him now. Um, but Kayleen comes by statement of faith, as if we were going to reject him anyway. Like, oh, this is not great by us. But um, Kayleen comes by statement of faith, and so we are excited um, that, I was just making sure I wasn't misspeaking, because that's my thing today. We are excited that Thomas and Kayleen are joining with us. Like I said, they are getting married in the next couple months. It's May, right? Yeah. May. Yeah. May 19th, and so watch for the invitation. We're just going to take over the church that day and be there supporting them. No, but they are starting their life together, and I'm excited to say that they've chosen to start their life together as they start their life with us here at our church. And we love them already. We're excited to have them a part of us. I am going to, um, first, we got to get the business out of the way. So I'm calling a short business meeting to order. Um, and I need a motion that we accept Kayleen as member of the church. I got Wayne first and a second. Just a second. All right. Wait. You, got, you got it, Wendy. Well, I was, Leah didn't turn out. She took me off. She, she, she knew. Eyes in the back of her head. Watch out. I'm in trouble. Uh, but we got a motion and a second. All in favor? Yes. Yeah. Any opposed? Good. We don't have to beat anybody in the parking lot. No, I'm just kidding. Sorry. That's very violent. I should have said that. But we are so glad. That closes our business meeting, by the way. We're so glad to have them. I'm going to send them to the back of the church because I know that you won't come to the front of the church to shake their hand. So I want them to have everybody as they come by to shake their hand and welcome them. Give them a hug. Let them know you're glad to have them. And I'll let you guys get a head start. Go on, go on ahead. And I will pray to dismiss us. Lord, we love you. God, I thank you so much for our church. I thank you for the family that is here, God. I thank you that it's not just a lecture hour on Sunday morning. It's not just a group of people that just have a, a loose acquaintance, Lord. But God, that we are a family, that we are growing together and growing towards you. I pray that you just help us to love each other more, help us to serve you more. If there's anyone here today that doesn't know you, Lord, I pray that you just help them to know that it's all about you, that all of life is summed up in you, and without you we have no hope. God, I pray that you just call them to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You are dismissed.